And with that, I'd like to introduce Dr. Bob Fry and his presentation, Missing the Point of Understanding. Thank you. Brenda, can you see my screen? Yes, I can. Okay. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you so much for that kind introduction, Brenda. And hello, everyone. Recently, I was engaged by a global Fortune 500 company to perform an end-to-end -end review of a series of detailed annotated proposal outlines. This was part of their pursuit of a multi-billion dollar Air Force contract in the Western United States. These annotated outlines had been crafted and populated by a team of highly competent and dedicated professionals in their respective fields of expertise. What I observed throughout the outlines across the three major sections that I reviewed was a definite lack of understanding. This despite the fact that the draft section L, instructions to offers, stated explicitly that the technical approach slash technical risk factor focuses on the offeror's approach to effectively and efficiently accomplish the requirements of the contract, thereby demonstrating understanding of those requirements. Another example of understanding from Section L comes from a 2023 NASA enterprise-wide solicitation. Demonstrate an understanding of the overall and specific requirements of the proposed contract. For the video oral presentation, section L stipulated that the offer shall provide a discussion that demonstrates a thorough understanding of the technology and demonstrate an understanding of delivering software development using fixed capacity teams. Section M, evaluation factors for award, documented that the video presentation will be evaluated for overall demonstrated comprehensive understanding. So clearly, understanding constitutes a critical requirement and dimension of evaluation for the government. In fact, federal government competitive solicitations invariably include a requirement to demonstrate understanding, particularly within the technical section of the proposal. Whether the solicitation is a request for quotations or a request for proposals, the language that the specific government agency uses to request industry's understanding is very much alike, as indicated here in these two examples. Now the question becomes one of how to demonstrate understanding by presenting aspects of your proposal with appreciable merit or capability requirements to the considerable advantage of the government during contract performance. Now this specific language comes from the definition of a significant strength in Department of Defense parlance found in DOD source selection procedures that were most recently updated August 20th of 2022. To rise to the level of a significant strength in NASA procurements, industry's understanding must greatly enhance the potential for successful contract performance. These words appeared in a NASA RFP from January of 2023. Let's pause for a second. Too many times when I review proposals for my customers in the understanding section, I read something like the following. The Defense Logistics Agency at New Cumberland, Pennsylvania issued a network infrastructure support services request for proposal to upgrade and install the network infrastructure of DLA information operations at 10 mandatory and four optional distribution locations nationwide. Turns out this was a direct lift of language from the RFP. 
It shows rudimentary knowledge of the facts, but does not convey the meaning of the facts or understanding as defined by authors Grant Wiggins and Jay McTighe in their book, Understanding by Design. In fact, the two key non-price reasons why companies of all sizes lose federal government competitive proposals are lack of demonstrated understanding and lack of a clear description of how the company will actually perform the work on the new program or project. What I see so many times is that for approach, companies will essentially equate approach with past performance and uh, simply indicate, well, we did this for the Navy, we'll do it for you. And that is obviously not on the pathway to winning. So how should we approach understanding in our federal proposals? Understanding is all about your federal government customer. That is their mission their success factors and critical issues, the current as-is state of their program or project, and the future to-be state of the program or project. Understanding equals customer. Understanding comes from the stated criteria, that is, the solicitation documents, questions and answers, and amendments. More importantly, understanding at a deeper level follows from the unstated criteria, gained through direct interaction with government decision makers through customer visits, industry days, and one-on-one -on -one discussions, as well as your teaming partners with incumbent experience serving the particular federal agency. I just completed work on a a uh, multi-billion dollar NASA procurement for which the industry day provided such amazing insights uh, that went far beyond many other federal government industry day uh, venues. Uh, in this case, the agency CIO uh, actually spoke from his mind and heart about what he had been, he and his team had been focused on for the past uh, roughly three years. And so, provided a tremendous amount of insight into what exactly were the goals of this program in plain English. Uh, I thought he did a masterful job and uh, I certainly captured his language during the, the industry day uh, virtual presentation uh, and baked those, uh, the language that he used into our proposal response. Now, over the years, I have developed and continue to hone a series of questions for proposal and capture teams to ask themselves when working to demonstrate understanding. For example, what business processes within the federal agency does this performance work statement area enable and support? What are the technical critical issues and challenges associated with this task currently? And how will those issues and challenges change in the future? How might innovation be introduced to this particular task in close collaboration with the government agency? Anytime industry proposes innovations, we should always do so in terms of candidate innovations. Not that we're going to go in and implement these innovations in a vacuum. Uh, we're going to do it in close collaboration with the government agency. And what would these innovations look like? To what other tasks does this specific task relate and how? How does this specific PWS task in combination with other tasks support the agency's overall mission? What particular federal mandates, policies, and procedures are related to the governance of this PWS area? 
And fundamentally, how would the particular government agency paint a picture of success on this task now and going forward? By the way, whenever I'm invited by my customers to go in with them to speak with federal civil servants, leaders, uh, one of the questions I always ask is, how do you paint a picture of success on this particular program or task or functional area? And then just listen. And then once the, uh, the time with that civil servant is concluded, uh, to document what I learned. It's amazing the insights that are provided that are, that are spoken just in plain English. Now, importantly, the words we understand, we recognize, or we are aware of that should not appear in your proposal at all. Instead, assert exactly what it is that your organization does understand. Illustrate that understanding in meaningful graphics and tables. Move beyond merely restating the requirements found in the solicitation documents in an effort to demonstrate understanding. That is a quick way to a low evaluation score or rating by the Government Source Evaluation Board. Frequently, proposal authors short circuit the full intention of the government's request for understanding by simply repeating what is in the RFP or RFQ, or that which was learned at various industry days that the government convened. Companies often begin their understanding sections with a discussion of what the government requires or needs or must have. For example, I recently read this quote, the government requires the intimate support of an industry partner with the knowledge, experience, and resources to meet the complex, diverse, evolving challenges of a no-fail strategic deterrence mission. Another direct quote, program management for this contract must reflect a closely aligned collaboration between government and contractor leadership to ensure sustained superior execution. Now, neither statement conveys meaningful below the surface understanding. Shown here are three very recent real deal examples of so-called understanding sections written for the same proposal by subject matter experts from a large business and a small business, which had teamed for this particular pursuit. Note the use of the words agency requires. In the second example shown here, understanding and approach are actually combined. This despite the fact that the solicitation document called for separate understanding and approach sections in industry's proposals. Now we'll explore a structured, repeatable process that I have developed to ensure that organizations convey genuine understanding in their proposals and increase the probability of winning. Specifically, consider asking and answering the following pivotal questions. Question one. What business processes within the government agency does this task or functional area enable and support. A case in point here, the US Customs and Border Protection, that is CBP's Office of Information and Technology, issued a solicitation for an, an enterprise data center support services contract. The data center was located on the US-Mexico border in California. Now on the surface, this procurement seemed to be all about information technology. However, there were much deeper business and financial dimensions. Turns out that this particular data center was used to capture critical information 
about truck traffic between the two countries. Data were used to support the collection of tariffs and taxes. The funds were transferred directly to the United States Treasury. This was actually an important source of revenue for the US. Now the following narrative is a subset of one of the understanding sections of this particular proposal for CBP. CBP is already facing the need to manage petabytes of data. In addition, there is an increasing requirement for storing data that will be used for business and mission support throughout CBP, as well as the Department of Homeland Security and other federal agencies. CBP's Office of Finance's accounting system sits on top of the database within the solution stack and is critical to the collection of $30 billion in tariffs and taxes each year. CBP has made major investments in Oracle's Exadata database appliance and already moved approximately 10 major applications to Exadata. Consolidating Oracle databases into Exadata reduces cost as well as drives down administrative burdens. I found this to be a very well-written, insightful, and meaningful paragraph on understanding. And then I wanted to share with you the lead in paragraph that conveyed understanding associated with task seven, which was one of more than 10 tasks in the C CVP proposal. Task seven supports a critical group of customer information control system based legacy systems that provide the foundation for some of CBP's most mission essential financial systems. In particular, major financial transactions systems within the CBP Office of Finance are supported in this mainframe environment. Task seven also involves support for the mission critical systems involved in the enforcement of US trade and tariff laws. While it is sometimes challenging to integrate these mainframe systems with newer systems and technologies, these CICS based applications provide CBP with functional, reliable, low risk systems for some of the agency's most important activities. In essence, the systems that Task 7 support are essential to all of CBP's revenue collection initiatives, as well as to the national security of the United States. Again, what I deem to be a very, very well written, thorough and insightful paragraph on understanding. Now let's move on to question number two. What particular mandates, policies and procedures, all within the federal arena, are related to the governance of this particular task? Let's look to NASA for one example. At an overarching level, the President's Management Agenda, or PMA, defines government-wide management priorities for all federal agencies to improve how the government operates and performs. In addition, the Program Management Improvement Accountability Act, that is Public Law Number 114-264, aims to improve program and project management practices within the federal go government. A critical governance document for NASA is the agency's policy directive 1001.0D, which is the 2002 NASA strategic plan. Now to drill down further with a focus specifically on safety, which is paramount within NASA, there are also policy directives and procedural requirements that govern activities and actions. In addition, there are other federal standards related to safety. These encompass 
NASA Procedural Directive 8700.1F, which is NASA's policy for safety and mission success. NASA's Procedural Requirement 8715.3D, which is NASA's general safety program requirements. NASA Procedural Requirement 8715.1B, which is NASA's safety and health programs. And finally, there's uh, 29 in the Code of Federal Regulations, 1910 Occupational Safety and Health Standards. All these are important in how NASA conducts uh, safety and how it expects its contractors to conduct their work in a safe manner. Now on to question number three. Who are the stakeholders of this particular customer organization? Another meaningful way in which to convey understanding without using the expression we understand is to construct a stakeholder diagram. This construct of a stakeholder diagram is part of the project management body of knowledge or PMBOK. In the example shown here for the Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation or FDIC's failed bank system, I built this four part diagram that captured governance and drivers, information technology interfaces, stakeholders and users of failed bank data including the United States Congress. Then coming behind me, technical subject matter experts vetted this graphic for accuracy and completeness. The notable outcome was that a significant amount of insight, that is understanding, was conveyed in a concise graphic that took approximately one half of a proposal page. You would be amazed at the wealth of meaningful government approved information that exists out on the web. Agencies, strategic plans, technology taxonomies, management plans, and learning agendas for all cabinet level agencies. I would strongly recommend that you mine these documents and others like them to construct on target understanding sections in your proposal. The good thing is that they're not uh, anything you have to pay for. These are all available in the public domain and agencies are required to prepare these kinds of documents. So it's, it's uh, incumbent upon industry to make sure that we fully recognize what goals the government has set, what, what framework that they're working under, the governance framework, uh, their particular uh, objectives and key performance indicators, those kinds of things are conveyed in this type of document. So take understanding very seriously. Your company's goal is to have understanding rise to the level of a significant strength in the government's source selection findings. Let me offer several direct and recent examples of those strengths related to understanding. In one source selection document, a significant strength was found for demonstrating a complete and highly effective understanding of the technologies involved in identifying and responding to cybersecurity incidents. In another, the proposal uh, contained a strength for complete understanding of how to address changing requirements 
propose test enhancements and implement government approved enhancements. To continue, a significant strength was found when the offer had presented an exceptionally clear, effective, and thorough strategy for cloud migration that demonstrated a significant depth of understanding. This includes outstanding understanding of current cloud computing services, their uses and challenges, as well as a superior plan for cloud migration workforce development through mentoring and supporting internal programs and key staffing. Now take note with this significant strain that the government cited that the prime contractor who proposed the cloud computing services discussed the uses and challenges associated with current cloud services. Presenting insight into the challenges is another great way to demonstrate in-depth understanding. A sizable number of senior managers, particularly in large corporations, convey through their words and their body language, even virtually, the position that, yeah, 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 we know all about this or that technique or process or approach. That's precisely why I relish the opportunity to work with small organizations to compete against large corporations. Being open, approaching activities with what Zen Buddhism calls beginner's mind is essential to increase business and personal maturity. I see evidence of lack of openness when it comes to understanding sections in proposals. However, everyone is most effective with an open mind. I'll close with a compelling understanding section that appeared in a real deal NASA proposal. NASA today is very different from the NASA of the 1960s. Not only has NASA delivered crucial technologies for society, such as water filtration systems and satellite-based search and rescue. It has also evolved its dominant logic and business model. NASA has moved from being a hierarchical closed system that develops its technologies internally to an open network that embraces global innovation, agility, and collaboration. As the leading agency in cutting edge scientific discovery and innovation, NASA faces diverse and evolving challenges and opportunities for application, security, and operations that support NASA's mission. Thank you so much for your engagement today. Now go in more stuff. Thank you, Bob. That was very, I just had so many good nuggets in there. And right now I'd like to open up the floor to questions. I ask that you put your question in chat. And while I wait for questions to come in, oops, I have one person in the waiting room here. Let me admit them. Um, I'd also like to ask the first question if that's all right with you. You know, sure. sometimes I find that, you know, I really like you. Know, I'm very passionate about getting the understanding right. Sometimes I could find customers are guarded, especially if you don't know them, you're coming in as a challenger. Do you have any tips for kind of breaking the ice so you can get that good understanding and good information from customers? Well, that goes to one of the questions that I suggest you asking. Mm -hmm. uh, and that is, that is, uh, how do you, Mr. or Ms. government customer, paint a picture of success on this program? Mm -hmm. That way, you're, we're, not, we're not talking about competitors. We're not talking about uh, anything that's, that's very particular to the incumbent. Uh, we're, we're opening up the, the landscape for them to just talk to us. And, and that's what I find to be so valuable is that um, 
uh, I, I think human beings by the very nature like to talk about that which they're interested in. And so I, I try to give them opportunities to do that. Uh, and then of course, you know, one ought to be prepared when going in to meet with government customers, uh, prepared, prepared to show your own awareness of their, their mission and, and their uh, technology roadmaps and, and their uh, management goals and that type of thing. Uh, so that so that you can demonstrate to them that that you bring a a solid foundation of uh, immersion in in their world. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Bob. I appreciate that. Uh, but we have questions from the audience right now, and they're in chat. The first one is: Can you re repeat the three things you should never say, such as we understand? Thanks. Uh -huh. And this is from uh, Joe. Uh, yes, we understand. We recognize, we're aware of. You know, I know, yeah. It, it's all trying to get around not using we understand by trying to be creative, but it's it's not. <laughs> all right. We're we're free. The floor is open if anybody else has any questions. If not, I'll ask one other question myself. This is a wonderful opportunity to talk to Bob in person here. You know, so many times people confuse the understanding and the approach. They think the understanding is the approach. You probably get that all the time. What's I the do. best advice that you give people, proposal managers who are tearing their hair out right now um, about dividing the two? Well, um, oftentimes I will see a proposal that includes the following. Uh, it'll say understanding section and then approach section. And in understanding, it starts off with our approach is, and in approach, we understand that. And you know, so it's a total inversion of, of what's being asked for. Um, I've also developed and, and honed over many years a series of uh, uh, questions that companies should ask related to approach, just as I did with, with understanding. I've I've also developed that uh, list of, of uh, uh, cogent and concise questions that you ought to be asking and answering uh, when it comes to approach. And uh, there, uh, just for general guidance, it it's focuses on the, the journalistic questions, the who, where, when, how, why, uh, and, and to, to respond to them uh, in such a way that, you know, one of the things that I often observe when I review proposals is that there's no discussion of who's actually going to be doing the work, the who. That's a, a critical part of the approach, uh, whether that is a named individual or a labor category or a job title. It, we need to show that human beings are actually doing the work. Mm -hmm. uh, again, so many times I read, uh, the plan will ensure that. Well, plans don't ensure anything. People applying the plan or following the plan ensure things, but they don't, uh, they, plans in and of themselves don't do anything. Uh, one, of the, one of the critical uh, dimensions of approach from my perspective is always to include some type of flow diagram. Whenever I see the word approach, I think of, of some diagram depicting what leads to what leads to what. And, uh, uh, and it's specifically focused on what your company will do. Um, approach is all about the following four elements. The people, processes that you will use, whether those are like ISO processes or uh, idle processes, um uh, knowledge it's it's uh important to recognize the the knowledge uh, the credentials the certifications and so forth that mm -hmm. that uh, your staff will need and then the tools and techniques that you'll apply so you can you can always frame approach in terms of people processes knowledge and tools and techniques uh so the and they have nothing to do with uh, the understanding side of the equation. 
Indeed. We have another quick question here. I'm going to read some of them from the bottom up. This is from Benita. Are some of your uh, questions and recommendations in the new book coming out? They are. And uh, thank you very much. Uh, yes, I, I have. It's not a seventh edition of my book. It's a, it's a new version. Uh, it's called Successful Proposal Strategies on the Go. It's uh, being published by Our Tech House in Boston and London, and it will be available in the fall of this year. Uh, it is uh, very much focused on um, stories from what, I, what I'll call proposal land that I've experienced over time, uh, but much, much more focused on recent uh, experiences where in, uh, you know, here is the situation and, and here's what I recommend that, that uh, you, the reader, uh, might consider in terms of addressing or solving that particular situation. So it's, it's, uh, it's whereas my previous six editions were much more of a, of a reference type of guide, uh, this is, this is uh, you can approach it, you can jump into any segment of the book and, and enjoy and uh, apply things. Okay, we're going to have to have you back on here after you publish that book, and uh, we'll, we'll talk about it. Okay, we have another question, too, here is, um, what are, this is from Yanuz, is, what are some suggestions for strong words to utilize in writing without the risk of overcommitting? Well, first of all, I would suggest we don't use the word utilize in, in any of our proposal writing. Uh, why not just use use? Uh, but then in terms of, of strong language uh, that, that doesn't overcommit, but at the same time uh, uh, conveys what we want to intend or what we intend is, uh, I like to leverage the language that appears in the government solicitation documents. So if they're talking about uh, comprehensive understanding, for example, I want to make sure that that word comprehensive appears in the, in the narrative of our proposal. Uh, also, I, I very much am attuned to the keywords that appear in Section M, the evaluation factors for award. Uh, words like feasibility, efficiency, effectiveness, innovation, uh, I, I always uh, leverage and reflect those words in the proposal because, you know, one of the things we need to keep in mind is that our proposal is not about our company. It's about our, how our company will support the federal government customer. And, and so we ought to be mirroring their language. That does not mean just parroting back their requirements, but it does mean if they call something help desk support, we don't be creative and say desk side support or end user support. So we wanna use uh, the language from the RFP or RFQ and, uh, and make sure that that, that is bolstered by uh, effective adjectives and, and, and meaningful adjectives. Here's, here's something to avoid uh, using terms like we have vast experience. Well, I can tell you as a small business or a mid-tier organization, you don't have vast experience. You have to quantify that experience. Uh, so we ought, ought not use words like vast or many uh, or extensive uh, because they don't have any meaning without some sort of quantitative uh, boundaries around them. Uh, but so many times I see words like unique well, again, unless you're one of, of very few companies in the world, you don't have many things that are unique, uh, at least not across all of uh, federal market space. So it's, it's really important to use precise language. Make sure that you engineer every word that you use in your proposal, that it's engineered to be in there, that it's bringing value that an evaluator can relate to. Uh, and so it's, it's, uh, I always, I always guide my customers to 
ensure that they're providing uh, metrics that, uh, mm -hmm. that validate their assertions. Bob, we have one more question here. It's kind of a long one, so I'm going to try to summarize it here. But we have, okay. uh, we have a, a question here. here. It's, they're from a small company. And it's rare that they have an opportunity to, you know, have in-person meetings or attend in events and industry days. How else can they dig deeper? Uh, I'm just going to summarize this to kind of uh, increase their understanding. Do you have any ways, you know, if they don't, don't have a lot of resources to go to all of these different industry events or uh, maybe even it's hard to get them in an in-person meeting. What are some secondary methods that they can use to increase their understanding? The the most effective ones are found on the web, and that, that goes back to agencies' strategic plans, agency learning agendas, uh, agency technology roadmaps, um, organizational uh, IT plans. Uh, there is just a host of, of publicly available information that, uh, in fact, in some cases, I just worked on one recently uh, from the National Cancer Institute where NCI had provided uh, several reference documents, including the Department of Homeland Security, I'm sorry, the Department of Health and Human Services uh, strategic plan and the NCI strategic plan as, so it's, there's so much publicly available information out there that even though you may not have time to go in to, to speak with multiple customers, you can uh, still get smart on your own. Mm -hmm. Indeed. Uh, I'll, we'll take one last question here. This one's from Lisa. How do you demonstrate understanding without arrogance in cases where a customer is requesting via a bid competition, a highly technical service for which you have extensive expertise and the customer clearly does not and therefore is uh, does not and therefore is planning an approach that is likely not to work or is significantly incomplete. And Lisa, feel free to unmute yourself if you want to <laughs> say anything yes, else about you, your question here. If, if you could... Uh... Uh, amplify that a bit, that'd be great. That'd be great. Sure. So uh, we, we work with some of the, the national labs and sometimes they've got um, projects planned that, um, and, and they've got a lot of really smart people and PhDs and what have oh, you, yeah. Oh, yeah. Um, but they might be planning something that you know, this is a, a once in a 20 or 30 year project for them. And most of the people that did it the last time may have retired. And this is something that we do on a regular basis. And they've, they've put out a bid spec and they've got this approach. And we look at it and go, you know what? There's some steps that you're missing, but you, if you don't, they don't, they don't want to hear that it's going to cost more money to do what they need to do. And they don't want to hear that they haven't, you know, completely thought that out. And so, you know, a lot of times we end up coming across as a little bit arrogant in our approach. And the question is, how do you, how do you demonstrate a thorough understanding um, in, a, in a way that will be positively received by the customer and that helps them be successful when it doesn't look like they're currently on a path to be successful? Oh, well, I'd, I'd, oh, I'd, I'd frame it. Exactly, in, in uh, according to what you said, Lisa, and that is uh, frame it in terms of of them being successful, and and uh, us or your company pointing out that uh, you know our experience demonstrates that the following seven uh, key steps are critical in, in this particular uh, activity. Uh, and we recognize in the in the uh, RFP or solicitation document that that not all those have been articulated. We just we want to make sure that that um, in order to have you be successful, that uh, we wanted to to raise the level of of attention to 
two of those seven areas that uh, have not necessarily been been focused on. Uh, and and obviously it's it's a kind of a dancing uh, game in terms of of uh, uh, you don't want to poke them in the eye, but at the same time you want to help them be successful in, in order to uh, to do that, you're going to have to win the contract and then perform on the contract with, but they're going to, you're going to have to help educate them or re-educate them in terms of what are the critical steps that have to be taken. And boy, we didn't, we didn't see two of those seven in the solicitation document. We, we want to elevate their, uh, uh, importance and and uh, their level of consideration in order to be successful as a team. Great. Well, great. Bob, okay, thank Bob, you. Bob, I'd like to thank you for coming and talking to the APMP Chesapeake chapter today. You know, you always have such great advice. And I'd also like to let you know that a recording is available. So at this point, I'm going to turn off the recording.